for those of you who do not know, um, an Ironman is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, and a 26.2 a marathon run at the end. I'll just pause. <laughs> so you get 17 hours, it starts at 7 a.m., and everybody has to cross the finish line by midnight. If you do not meet certain checkpoints, your race is over. You haven't felt failure until you've trained for over a year, gone to a race, and went to the bike, got on the bike, did the swim, did the 112 miles, and had this nice little volunteer walk up to you and say, sorry, you're too late. And that's exactly what happened to me in 2008 when I first tried Ironman. I trained, I had been doing uh, triathlons for four years. I started in 2004. And when I grew up, I was not an athlete. And it's still hard for me to say that I am, even though I did this race. Um, I grew up a poor black child on the south side of Chicago doing things that people in my community did, like eat. Um, I was not into sports unless you count competitive eating as a sport. Uh, I did not do anything when I was little except for my dad, when I was about seven, took me to the local YMCA in Roseland and said, you need to learn how to swim. I think he did it as a protective mechanism. He wanted to, me to have water safety, but I learned how to swim and I loved it. Flash forward to 2004 in my 30s. Um, people say, how do you, a couch potato, self-proclaimed couch potato, get into Ironman, get into triathlons? And while I have all kinds of answers for that question that are really intelligent and wonderful because I'm strong and amazing, blah, blah, really, it was a guy. <laughs> and I'm just being honest here, a really sexy guy, right? Okay. And he was an ultra marathon runner. And which means he ran 100 miles, like, on a whim, right? And we were the opposite as opposite could be. He was tall, link, lith, lith. he was tall, lith, lanky, a runner, and I was short and not a runner, right? And he signed me up for my first 5K. And after I crossed the finish line, about an hour after he crossed the finish line from doing his 10K, uh, I felt a sense of accomplishment. And I said, you know, I can do this again. So he encouraged me to go swimming, and so I went swimming, and we dated for a while, and, but I was still overweight. I was uh, over 200 pounds, and I had been over 200 pounds all my life, and never really known what it was like to be athletic or, or, or be fit. But I went swimming every day. And someone saw me swimming, and they said, hey, you should do a triathlon. And I said, what's that? And they said, you swim, bike, and you run. And I said, at the same time? And they said, no, no, one after the other. And I said, oh, OK. So then somebody mentioned to me a relay where you just do one of those. And I said, oh, I can do that. So I was signing up for my first triathlon. It was 2004. I was over 200 pounds, but I was going to do the swimming part. And the other two ladies who wanted to do the relay dropped out, right? So it was just me. So I said, you know, I can do this, right? It's the sprint. I can do this, even though I didn't know what I was doing. When I crossed the sprint finish line, it was like I had found manna from heaven. I found the gold. It was so exciting for me. Now, it was just a small pool swim and a 12-mile bike and a 5K at the end, but I had felt like I had crossed the Sahara and, you know, I had won Olympic gold. And so I was hooked. And so I started doing triathlons uh, all the way up to 2008 when I signed up peer pressure for Ironman. Now, Ironman is a whole different ball of wax. Anybody who's done the race always says it's about the journey. The training is just ridiculous. <laughs> I'm doing another Ironman this year, and I'm just so involved in the training. I, it, it, just, it just hurts thinking about it. But I wasn't well trained for 2008, and of course, I did not finish. I DNF'd, and it was devastating. And um, after that, I got married, I got divorced. I kind of went into a depression, and I think here I'm a biscuit shy from 300 pounds. I gained so much weight. I ate and ate and ate and tried to eat my fears away. And I said I was never going to do triathlon again. I was done. It wasn't for fat black chicks like me. I could not do it. It was impossible. So I get, I get divorced. I move back to Chicago, and 
I move in with my parents, you know, the whole, now you're not 20, you're in your late 30s, and your life is all turned around. And reflexively, I joined the Chicago Triathlon Club. I just couldn't stay away. And so I did another sprint, and then I did a 5K, and then in 20, I was still big and overweight, I started, but I started getting involved in triathlon here in the Chicago area. And I started volunteering for TriMasters, which is a great youth program on the south side that does triathlon training for young uh, African-American youth. And so I started throwing sprint triathlons to raise money and awareness and even participated. Here is me uh, in one of those indoor triathlons. But I had decided that Ironman was off the table because I'm not an athlete. Um, only true athletes can do that. Um, but once I kind of got into tri the triathlon community, I, had, I met other African-American women who wanted to do sprint triathlons. They found out about my history and started asking me to help them. And so I started nurturing them and teaching them how to swim and really encouraging them to, to take risk and do the triathlon and, and, you know, face their fears. And I felt like a hypocrite because I wasn't facing my own. I had given up on my dream and my journey and I had decided that it wasn't for me. So December 2012, I wrote down in my journal right before New Year's Eve that I was going to do Ironman. I was 285 pounds, and it was an impossibility. When I talk about making the impossible possible, I just wanted to show you that you can do that. But the first thing that I had to concentrate on was the making part. I always think in the John Hughes movies that things come together for a happy ending, kind of like osmosis, right? It just happens. But in life, when I started studying people who were successful, even after they failed, I found out that they were doing a lot of work. <laughs> they were making it happen. So when I talk about making the impossible possible, I looked at myself and I said, what do you have to do to make this dream come true? And I had to face the hard fact was, and it's just kind of physics and gravity, that the less you weigh, the faster you are. Now, losing weight is not that big of a deal, right? People do it every day. In fact, I was doing it, you know, every six months or so, <laughs> gaining and losing and gaining and losing. But I decided that I really wanted to give my best to this race, and I made the hard choice. So the first step for me for making the impossible possible was concentrating on the making, and that meant I had to make the hard choices. So I cut out all the things that I knew were not making me perform well. So I dropped dairy, I dropped red meat, I changed my diet completely. You can look at my Grubhub, and it will show you my evolution from Chinese takeout to Mediterranean food till it just drops off a cliff because I started cooking on my own. I got books, I dabbled in veganism, all these kinds of things, but I found the right formula for me. And then I started Ironman training and walked into an Ironman training group here in Chicago, well fit, and said, make me an Ironman. I was 265 pounds. I followed their regiment to a T and changed my diet. And in six months, which I still marvel today, I lost over 100 pounds. And so I went from a biscuit shy of 300 to that's the, the photo on the right is me the day before I left for my Ironman Cozumel race. I was determined to be as fast as I could on the bike because I did not want that sweet volunteer walking up to me telling me I was too late. Um, I did it. You saw it. It's on video. It's live. I finished the race, and then I thought, that is the end of my journey. I did it. And then I started getting all of these calls from around the country, from African-American women who had saw my story on Facebook, right? It's, it doesn't happen if it's not on Facebook, right? You have to put it. And I was writing a blog, and I was just telling everybody, and I was being really honest and authentic of what it was like to go through this grueling race, not being an athlete, not having an athletic background. And I didn't know why I did it. I just did it. Somebody asked me to. They said, will you post your training? And I did. And something incredible happened. What I learned about making the impossible possible is that when you do, others see. 
So I started doing these things to change my life and transform, and other women around the country started seeing it. And then they looked at me and they said, she did, so I can. I was very shocked by this. I was, I'm an only child, so even though I'm an extrovert, I'm kind of like an introvert. I'm a geek. I like being with myself. But people kept Facebooking me and emailing me and saying, will you help me? Will you help me do what you did? And this is Angela. Angela's in the audience. And I have to tell this funny story. After Ironman, I decided to get certification as a swim coach. The biggest barrier to triathlon is the swim. And many women do not uh, do the races because they do not know how to swim. And so I thought being a swim coach would be great. People could see someone that looks like them swimming, and I'm still alive, and maybe they might try it. And I was in the locker room, I had just swam, and I was naked, because I was in the locker room. And I was tiling off, and this woman looks at me. And I'm like, what is she looking at? Like, why is she looking at me? Like, I'm naked, yo. <laughs> and she's like standing around, like doing this. And then finally she walks up to me and she says, are you Olvetta? And I say, yeah. <laughs> and she says, you did the Iron Man. And that was the first moment that I thought about me completing my journey wasn't for me. It had, I was so insular and so committed. I was committed to the point of obsession about this race that I didn't even realize the impact that I was having on my own community. And Angela and I got to talking and she said, you know, I want to do a triathlon. Will you coach me? Now, again, couch potato, no athleticism, no athlete, somebody else is wanting me to entrust their athletic career in my hands. I could not believe it. And I always tell Angela that she forced me to be a coach <laughs> because she just would not leave me alone. <laughs> and she insisted that I was going to be her coach. And I'm so glad that she did because this is the true journey. So after I coach Angela and Nikki, they, they, Angela did her first sprint triathlon, and then she signed up for Olympic, and I coached her. I started faith-inspired triathlon training, and I was determined to start the triathlon training group on the south side of Chicago. Um, all the triathlon trainings, mostly of the programs, are up north because people up there do triathlons like every day. <laughs> um, but I was, I was considered, I, I just considered the fact that if I could do it, and if I wanted to do it, that other women like me would want to do it as well. And I wanted it to be convenient because I wanted to eliminate the barriers. I wanted them to be able to make the hard choices in the easiest way possible. And I never wanted them to feel like I felt on that day in 2008 when a volunteer walked up to me and said, you are not ready for this. So that's why I started Faith Inspired Triathlon Training on the South Side, partnered with the Croc Center, on 119th and Roseland and started a program that would teach people to swim and have them work out and bike and run. And it was amazing. We took 12 women who had, a lot of, of those women wouldn't even put their face in the water. I remember <laughs> Anna came and I had put beads in the bottom of the pool and had people to go get them. And she had a, a shirt on, she didn't even have a swimsuit. And she got the bead without the shirt being wet at all. It was like a miracle. <laughs> I was like, how do you do that? And she crossed the finish line at her first triathlon and came in third because of her swim. So I was seeing all of these amazing transformations that people were having, and I was so excited. So when I talk about making the impossible possible, when you make the impossible possible for yourself, you have to make the hard choices. When you do, others see. And you can't hog all your goodness. You have to share it. And that means mentoring and coaching others and, and giving back. And so that's what we do at Faith Inspired Triathlon Training. And now I'm just coaching right now because I'm doing Ironman, but we'll start the program up again soon. This is, this is another one of uh, Melvin. He's in our group in Faith Inspired Triathlon Training. And this is Anastasia. I'm coaching her as well. She's doing her first half Ironman and Angela and myself on a bike ride. And I joined all these other groups in Chicago and created this, we created this nucleus of fitness. So it was the Major Taylor 
Club of Chicago, which is an African-American um, um, cycling group. Uh, Men Run D Streets, which is a group that promotes African-Americans, uh, uh, men in urban cities to run and train for marathons and half marathons. Black Girls Run, which uh, helps uh, African-American women um, run. And, and my own program, which, which looks at swimming for African-American men and women. And then I, the nucleus that I created grew, um, that we created here in Chicago. I also found nucleus in other cities, in Florida with the diversity and aquatics program. And uh, Megan, who's on the right here, uh, is in New York. And the funny story about Megan is that she found out about me 10 years ago when I first did my first triathlon. And she called me on the phone and said, because you did that, I started my triathlon training program in New York. And that was just an amazing honor. And Lisa Laws is now a coach. She's, on, she's, she's right here. She's an Ironman as well. And so we're creating a legacy of fitness in our community. And I'm so excited by it because people think it is impossible that diabetes and high blood pressure and obesity are what we will all have to face as a, cultural, as a culture. And I'm here to say that that's not true. So when you make the impossible possible for yourself, the cool thing is it happens for other people. Thank you.